Hello, and welcome back to Heights Library's podcast, Unpacking 1619, where you can explore the interviews we've collected with scholars from around the country, in which we unpack topics relating to race in America. I'm your host, John Pichet, and I'm thrilled to share these interviews with you here. Today's episode, we welcome Gerald Horn, the John J. and Rebecca Morris Chair of History and African American Studies at the University of Houston. Professor Horn discusses his book, The Dawning of the Apocalypse, The Roots of Slavery, White Supremacy, Settler Colonialism, and Capitalism in the Long 16th Century. Professor Horn explains his thesis that religion supported so much colonial expansion and gave way to race, specifically whiteness, as a way of organizing conquest. Uh, Gerald Horn, Morris Professor of History and African American Studies, University of Houston, author of, among other books, The Dawning of the Apocalypse, which deals with the roots of slavery, white supremacy, settler colonialism, and capitalism in the long 16th century, meaning approximately 1492 or thereabouts to 1607 when London establishes a settlement in what it calls Virginia. Yes, and uh, thank you for being with us. And I found the book in, in really incredible. Um, it's really well written and, and just such a great narrative that just goes right through mm. in, in a way that's really understandable. Um, but I love this idea of the apocalypse. And maybe you could kind of um, explain to us how you came to that word and how you came to kind of formulate this book. Well, you may know that before this book was published, I published a book on the 17th century entitled The Apocalypse of Settler Colonialism. And the book at hand, in many ways, is a prequel to the 17th century book. I use the term apocalypse because it's a word that is rather well known, I would say, uh, in the English language. Uh, Apocalypse Now, the Francis Ford Coppola movie about the war in Vietnam. And obviously it's meant to signify what befell the indigenous population of North America, including Texas, where I'm now sitting, and Ohio, where I assume you are sitting. And it also is a word that describes what befell people of African descent, because with the arrival of the settlers in North America and the evisceration of the indigenous population, uh, that paved the way for the arrival of more enslaved Africans, which at once uh, helped to distort the development of the parts of Africa from where they were taken, uh, not to mention, to put it euphemistically, distorting the lives of those who arrived on these shores. Yeah, thank you for that. And I, I, it was a, it's such a great um, way to describe kind of this invasion, right? Mm -hmm. Because we have been taught in the Western kind of history that uh, these people were coming to a new world, when in fact they were coming to a world that was populated and robust and had um, civilizations on it. And it marks the end of kind of their civilization, the beginning of this new uh, project, as it were, in colonialism. So maybe you could talk a little bit about how that project comes to be and you know how, how Europeans start moving across the globe in this mm. in this way of and you know ushering in this apocalypse as wherever they go mm -hmm. well as i tell the story uh, 1492 is the hinge moment uh, you may recall that those we refer to as the spanish had the first movers advantage uh, by 1565 they had invaded what they call florida and a few decades later uh, had invaded what they called New Mexico, both contemporary states of the United States of America. And one of the things I'm trying to do is shift the narrative with regard to European settlement away from what we call Virginia and Massachusetts uh, 
and more so to the states now known as Florida and New Mexico. But in order to understand why the Spanish moved westward across the Atlantic, you have to understand some of the history leading up uh, to that hinge moment. Uh, in the book, I go back as far as the end of the 11th century and the Crusades, but for our purposes here, I'll begin in 1453 with Muslim forces, as they were then described, uh, taking over what was then known as Constantinople, and the Muslims were fairly thought to be on the march. Uh, you re might recall that in the 8th century, uh, they had barely been defeated with regard to uh, taking over France, for example. However, 1492 marks a moment when you have a sharp contestation between the rulers of Spain, who are mostly Spanish, excuse me, who are mostly Catholic, and the uh, Muslim forces who had been ruling the Iberian Peninsula uh, for hundreds of years, up until 1492. However, despite the defeat of the so-called Muslim forces on the Iberian Peninsula in 1492, uh, France, excuse me, Spain could hardly rest on its laurels uh, because it was thought that the Muslims were on the march. And certainly the idea of the Western Europeans, the Spanish moving across the Atlantic, in part, it was a response to the so-called Muslim forces continuing moving westward <laughs> towards uh, Spain, towards the Iberian Peninsula. And uh, 1492 also marks the time when you have a persecution, a deepening persecution of the Jewish population of the Iberian Peninsula. In fact, there is speculation that when Columbus, Christopher Columbus, the man we would refer to today as Italian, uh, sponsored by those who we would refer to today as the Spanish, uh, sails across the Atlantic, that there may have been uh, Jewish migrants, quote unquote, uh, on ships alongside him. In any case, uh, Spain has the first movers advantage along with its neighbors, speaking of the uh, Portuguese, and uh, they uh, begin to rout and depopulate uh, the island we now refer to as Hispaniola, which houses today's Haiti and today's Dominican Republic. Uh, they begin to rout and depopulate wildly throughout the Caribbean. But what's remarkable about this Spanish invasion, and it's a point that should be flagged here, as I go on to talk about why we're now speaking English, is that the Spanish had religious markers with regard to who would be prized settlers. Uh, it's not as if what has transpired in today's United States, that is to say, where Europeans of whatever religious stripe could find sanctuary in North America. Uh, Spain had religious discrimination. and But at the same time, uh, this also meant that the position of Africans would be rather anomalous in the sense that if they profess Christ, uh, Catholicism, professed uh, the Catholic version of, Christ, uh, of Christianity, uh, they could be conquistadors, and which, of course, did not rule out, to put it mildly, the possibility that other Africans, heathens, as they might be called, uh, could be enslaved, not to mention uh, those indigenous who were unable to flee the grasp of the Western European invaders. However, uh, as you put a pin in 1492, put a pin in 1517, because that's the moment of the Protestant secession from 
Catholicism. That is to say, Martin Luther, a man we would refer to as German, rebelling against what he sees as various transgressions uh, in the Catholic Church, uh, corruption, uh, not least. And uh, he leads the Protestant secession, which by the 1530s takes London by storm. And uh, many in your audience made on the story about Henry VIII and the story about uh, how he wanted to have these divorces and the Catholics were not necessarily uh, amenable to these proposals and that greases the skids for his uh, joining the uh, Protestant secession. At the same time, it should be mentioned that with the Protestant secession, uh, Henry VIII and those who surrounded him were able to not only seize power from Catholics who had been wielding significant influence in London, but also able to seize a good deal of their property as well. However, uh, this sets up a round robin of religious conflicts and, in fact, religious wars. Obviously, the Catholics had a significant advantage because there were simply more of them. Uh, they had a longer history, certainly stretching well before 1517. And so the Protestant Londoners were the scrappy underdogs with regard to this religious conflict with the Catholics. Certainly, if they wanted to feast at the bountiful table of settler colonialism, uh, they would need to improvise, which they did. That is to say, rather than opting for a religious marker for settlements, the Londoners uh, were much more ecumenical, shall we say, ecumenical insofar as the pan-European world is concerned. Uh, what I mean by that is, recall how we had talked about the uh, persecution of the Jewish population on the Iberian Peninsula, the Inquisition, whereby those who did not profess the Spanish version of Catholicism could be tortured and or liquidated. Uh, obviously, this provided an incentive for those Jewish folk uh, who were able to flee. Interestingly enough, uh, England had expelled its Jewish population as early as the end of the 13th century, uh, 1291, to be more precise. But uh, as they were under the gun, figuratively speaking, in the 16th century, uh, they improvised. And uh, they were not uh, adverse to welcoming the Jewish population into their settlements, nor were they adverse necessarily uh, to welcoming uh, Catholics into their settlements. Uh, it would have been beyond imagination for the Iberians, particularly the Spanish, to welcome those who were Jewish and those who were Protestant into their settlements, unless they engaged in some sort of, some sort of camouflage, which many of them did. That is to say, they professed to be Catholic, but they actually they weren't. Uh, indeed, uh, I recount some of the stories that are still prevalent in New Mexico. Recall that that was an early Spanish settlement, now a U.S. state, where you have folks whose roots today stretch back to the late 16th century, uh, in the privacy of their homes, they engage in certain kinds of practices that uh, evoke the practices of the Sephardim, of the Jewish population of the Iberian Peninsula. Uh, that is to say, uh, presumably what happened is that you had the Sephardim, they migrated hundreds of years ago uh, in Spanish ships, camouflaged as Catholics, but then in the privacy of their home, they would engage in traditional Jewish rituals. Uh, recall as well that if you look at the history of the current U.S. state known as Maryland, 
uh, it's well known that the original, many of the original settlers uh, in Maryland were actually Catholics. Uh, again, uh, that was a London settlement. Uh, it would have been quite unusual, to put it euphemistically, <laughs> for the Spanish to accommodate the Protestant settlers or non-camouflage Jewish settlers uh, in their colonies. But uh, as we all know <laughs> from living in what used to be a London settlement, speaking of those of us who are now in North America, that the London option basically won out. And that uh, this idea of religious markers for settlement uh, proved not to be the winning ticket, to put it mildly. I, I say that with full awareness of the point that south of the U.S. border, uh, overwhelmingly, there are Spanish speakers, other than uh, Brazil, which is predominantly uh, Portuguese speaking, other than Martinique and Guadeloupe, uh, and to a degree, uh, what we call Haiti, which are predominantly French speaking. Uh, but uh, it's also fair to say that the baton that was passed from London uh, to its spawn in North America, speaking of the nation now known as the United States of America, uh, proved to have the winning formula in terms of settler colonialism. Now, uh, before many of your audience become misty-eyed and begin to puff up their chests with regard to that notion, uh, keep in mind that there was a very significant downside. Recall, <laughs> downside obviously being a euphemism, recall what I said a moment or two ago about uh, African conquistadors. Well, given this transition uh, in London settlements, from using religion as a marker to pan-Europeanism, or what we would refer to today as whiteness, uh, that is to say those who had been warring on the shores of Europe, uh, English versus Irish, English versus Scots, English versus Wells, Welsh, uh, British versus German, German versus Pole, Pole versus Russian, Russian versus Lithuanian, Lithuanian versus Estonian, Serb versus Croat, Northern Italian versus Southern Italian. I mean, the list is endless. All of a sudden, when they cross the Atlantic, they have a new identity, which is, quote, white, unquote. Now, this new identity, or identity politics, to use the current 21st century phrase, had a real downside <laughs> for those who were not so described. Uh, that would include, obviously, the indigenous population, and of course, as I'm sure your audience knows, the indigenous population under the Spanish flag too was horribly persecuted, but it had a particular momentous significance for the population of African descent. Uh, that is to say that obviously the overwhelming bulk of the enslaved African population crossing the Atlantic after the indigenous are swept aside, were not inducted into the hollowed halls of whiteness. And uh, unlike, uh, say, Spanish Cuba, uh, for example, uh, they could not be viewed as conquistadors or the equivalent uh, under uh, the Union Jack. And uh, th this sets up uh, this system that today we refer to as white supremacy. Now. As I tell the story, uh, one of the difficulties in confronting, if not extirpating, a white supremacy is the deep religious roots. Uh, to return to a, a point that I made a moment or two ago, uh, you could easily make an argument that uh, white supremacy and the kind of racism that we've become familiar with in the United States has religious roots. Uh, in fact, in the first few pages of my book, I draw parallels between the kinds of uh, prosecutorial tropes 
that were deployed against the Jewish population before they were expelled in England. That is to say, uh, supposedly they had odors. Uh, there were those who said, or peculiar odors, I should say. There were those who tried to prevent them from being property owners. There were those who tried to prevent them from marrying across confessional lines. Uh, all manner of persecution. Uh, in many ways, that's just shipped uh, to the uh, African population as the scrappy underdogs that are the Protestants then begin to induct the Jewish population to the Hall of Halls of Whiteness. Now, I don't want to make too much of this because I'm sure there are those in your audience who are familiar with the ugly history of anti-Jewish fervor uh, under the Union Jack and certainly under the Stars and Stripes up to and including uh, the lynching of Leo Frank, the Jewish man in Georgia, about 105, 110 years ago. But uh, I'm talking about relativity. Uh, that is to say that, as I'm sure uh, many scholars of the Jewish experience would remind us, uh, many Jewish people found the United States to be a sanctuary <laughs> compared to what they were experiencing uh, in Germany for example, or in Poland, for example, or in Russia, for example. So we're talking about relativity. That's the point that needs to be reinforced. But in any case, uh, this question of the religious roots, the religious background of this notion of white supremacy, which is assumed a, a, what appears to be a to some, it appears to some to be a kind of permanence, although I don't necessarily accept that idea. Uh, I don't think you can begin to uh, understand that without understanding this kind of historical portrait that I am now seeking to paint. Yeah, and I think that that uh, was one of the things that struck me the most was this tie between kind of um, religi religiosity and how it transforms into um, another system of allegiance, but also um, identity. So, you know, with religion, you can, as you were saying, can hide your true religion and still look the same on the outside, whereas uh, racial markers are harder to to hide, impossible in some regards, right? And then um, the thing that I loved about this argument is this idea of the synthetic whiteness, right? And how the, the British or the London started to import white people, but found that problematic and had to find other things, other people uh, to kind of bring over to do their heavy lifting, if you were. Mm -hmm. uh, but you use the word gritty, which I think is such a fantastic word to describe some of the, the history we're talking about. So maybe you could talk about a little bit about how that process happens, right? How London starts with white people and then eventually moves into um, into the African slave trade. Hmm. Well, as your comment suggested, it was not easy to exploit European migrants in the way the exploiters wanted to exploit them. I mean, for example, in a book I wrote on the 18th century, I talked about the formation of the state of Georgia, as we now call it. Uh, formed in 1733. Now, interestingly, the original idea in Georgia was to have no black people allowed uh, because they, by 1733, uh, there had been plenty of experience with these enslaved Africans and the downside of having them. They were often prone to revolt they were prone to engage in arson. They were prone to engage in poisonings. Many of them uh, could be called ethnobotanists in terms of their knowledge of plants. They were prone to engage in murder. And they were prone to burn down the fields, burn down the master's house. It was 
from a certain point of view of the enslavers, it was a nightmare. So the idea in Georgia in 1733 was that you were going to have European uh, migrants. But of course, the problem there was is that many of these European migrants, uh, they did not want to do that heavy lifting in the fields. They could more easily escape into urban environments because of their phenotype, because of their melanin deficiency, if you like. And uh, then there was the idea that um, by importing these European masses, you're basically importing a class question <laughs> because you were importing a, a lot of poor Europeans uh, who were not necessarily uh, predisposed to go along with being exploited <laughs> as, as cheap labor. And uh, you would have similar sorts of uprisings, uh, for example, perhaps not as 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 all encompassing as those delivered by Africans, but of course, uh, still damaging. So soon after being founded in 1733, uh, you saw Georgia begin to exploit uh, and import enslaved Africans uh, into Savannah, the, the major slave port. And on the cusp of the revolt against British rule in 1776, which leads to the formation of the nation now known as the United States of America, uh, Georgia had uh, one of the most sizable black populations amongst the colonies, despite the fact that in 1733, a few decades earlier, uh, supposedly it was going to say no Negroes allowed. And what's interesting as well is the elasticity of this concept of whiteness. Uh, and, and, and I should say, I'm not the first scholar to, to address this question, just to, to be fair. Um, but rather than <laughs> issuing oral footnotes, let me just con continue with this narrative. <laughs> the elasticity uh, of, of whiteness. I mean, uh, for example, uh, and, and it's very tricky, too. You can still see the religious roots. Ralph Nader, the man who ran for president some years ago, is still in the land of the living. Uh, he is of Lebanese origin but Lebanese Christian origin. And so therefore, in the popular sense at least, he's viewed as, quote, white, unquote. However, if a leader of Hezbollah, the Lebanese resistance movement of 2023, migrates to the United States, presumably Muslim, uh, he would be considered third world. Uh, or, or, or to look at, um, you might have to help me with this pronunciation, the woman who is the host on the Today Show, or Hoda, K-O-T-B. Kotib? Is that how you pronounce yeah, it? I think Kotib, maybe? Okay. Yep. She is, of course, of uh, Egyptian Christian origins. And so, therefore, because of her U.S. accent, perhaps her religious background, uh, she could... Uh, I think she's at least popularly constructed as quote white, unquote. Or to, to, to my third example would be Queen Noor of Jordan, who was married to the former king, Hussein. Uh, she was born Lisa Hollaby in the United States, Syrian Christian background, considered an so-called all-American girl, given her uh, tenure at Princeton University. When she marries the king, she converts to Islam. I dare say that if she crossed the Atlantic uh, today, uh, this Sunni Islamic woman would not necessarily be seen as an all-American woman, even though in her early life she was seen as an all-American girl. And so you, you, the only way to sort of unravel this is to really look at the religious roots of the construction of, of race, and the construction of whiteness. And at the same time, it's important to point out that um, this construction has had elasticity. Um, those who are Arab, uh, 
can be inducted into the halls of whiteness, especially if they have religious roots like Ralph Nader or the former Lisa Hollaby. And those who are Muslim would have more difficulty. Uh, although, of course, we know, based upon what we've said about Spain, that there is a certain camouflage and that uh, I guess if you're a, a, a Muslim woman who does not cover the head and you have a US accent, you presumably could be inducted into the halls of whiteness. But if you cover your head, I'm not so sure. Yeah, and then we see some of that. Uh, I mean, I don't I, I would love to get into Christian nationalism in a moment, but I'd kind of like to return first to um, this idea of uh, African slave trade. And one of the things that's constantly brought up um, in, uh, and maybe you've heard the argument, I think uh, Thomas Sowell makes the point that the, uh, that the British, not the British, but the slavery is as old as there is economic systems. Mm -hmm. And why should we then villainize the American form of it? Or the you know the colonial form of it as it came to be codified uh, in the, the British colonies. Um, so maybe you could talk about like how what was going on in Africa at this point, and how did the how did Africans end up over here um, <laughs> in, in the way that they did? Because I think that 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 story is is something that uh, in this context is incredibly fascinating. Well, yeah, it's interesting in the United States. Uh, it, it might still happen. And when I was living in New York, um, in Times Square, there you had these hustlers. They were play a, what we call a, a shell game. You know, they'd have these holes of nuts, and they have a little, uh, a little sphere under the hole, and then they would be doing this, and you're supposed to guess what, which. What, what hole was beneath what shell. And it was called a shell game. And uh, what it signifies, in my estimation, is how rationales shift like the sphere under the shell. For example, the original rationale or the initial rationale for the United States is it was this exceptional nation, uh, a great leap forward for humanity. Haven't seen the likes of it before or since. But then when you say, well, what about slavery? And what about indigenous dispossession? Then, then the, the argument show, everybody was doing it. So why are you, why are you picking on us? <laughs> Wait a minute, I thought you said it was exceptional. Well, you know, it, 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 it's, it's basically, it's sort of intellectually dishonest. Either it's exceptional or it's like everybody else. You can't, I don't see how you can be both unless... Unless you want to make an argument, as you, I used to be a lawyer, as the lawyers might say, that you have the cleanest, dirty shirt. <laughs> okay, if you want to make that argument, fine. But don't, don't try to, to have it both ways. So you, on the one hand, it's a great leap forward for humanity. You bring up the Africa. Well, it was obviously not a great leap forward for Africans. So then you say everybody was doing it. But even if you, you get to this question of everybody was doing it, you have you have to draw the distinctions. I mean, for example, uh, Canada and the United States have many commonalities. I mean, th th there are different kinds of capitalism, for example. The capitalism that exists in the United States uh, does not have the health care system that you have in Canada, a single payer, where basically your health care is subsidized. You're in Cleveland, right across the lake. <laughs> You have a different system altogether. And so you have different systems of capitalism. I mean, the kind of capitalism you have in the Scandinavian countries, more of a social democratic capitalism where you pay more taxes than oftentimes than you do in the United States, but then you get more benefits as well. Uh, you get uh, longer vacations, for example. You get uh, longer uh, tenure for paternity, or after you have children, for example, longer, more time off. Uh, so likewise, there are different kinds of slavery. And uh, the, the particular indictment of US slavery 
has been what I've alluded to before, which is that uh, this, this virtual equivalence between blackness and slavery, uh, reference what I said a moment or two ago about the Spanish Cuba, for example, where you had African conquistadors, and then, if, then uh, you have other kinds of slavery where one can more easily migrate up the socioeconomic ladder. I mean, for example, uh, some of your audience might remember uh, Prince Bandar of Saudi Arabia. He was the Saudi ambassador to the United States during the George W. Bush era and uh, wildly affluent, part of the Saudi ruling elite. His private plane was painted the colors of his favorite football team, the Dallas Cowboys, silver and blue. And his skin was as dark as mine. But the kind of slavery that existed in that part of the world allow for more upward mobility, for example. This, that, that was generally true, for example, for slavery and the Ottoman Empire. That is to say, what distinguished Ottoman Turkish slavery was that they, they didn't just enslave black people. They certainly enslaved quite a few black people. They enslaved, uh, as if you go to the Balkans, if you go to the former Yugoslavia, go to uh, Serbia. Of course, you have a number of people of Ser Serbian origin in Cleveland, uh, Croatians, uh, Bulgarians. The Ottomans were enslaving Circassians in particular, particularly Circassian women. They had this real fetish for Circassian women. So uh, this, this equivalence of black people with slavery was not necessarily the norm worldwide. Just as it's not necessarily the norm worldwide to have a single payer healthcare system under capitalism that you have in Canada, for example. So I, I, I think it's well past time for uh, those in the United States who are trying to understand US slavery, to understand the reality of US slavery, to understand the nature of what is called chattel slavery. That is to say, uh, the enslaved being the equivalent of a horse or a mule or a table, for example, and uh, the limits on upward mobility, for example, and uh, how the fact that how this facilitates a certain kind of uh, bestiality, particularly towards women of African descent, uh, because uh, it provides a, a kind of incentive for the enslaver to rape the enslaved woman. That's one of the reasons you have so many different skin colors amongst black people in the United States today. And then that gets me to the other point which is that uh, the so-called one drop rule, uh, which facilitates enslavement. You could look like George W. Bush or Madonna, but if it was thought that you had a scintilla of so-called African blood, you were a slave. Now, obviously, that broadens the base for enslavement. And of course, it, 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 there, there are cases of European migrants landing in New Orleans uh, and uh, somehow they're traduced into being slaves because it's said that they have one drop of African blood, so-called. And so it, it, it creates this idea that there's something wrong with being of African descent. Um, and I should also say that given the fact that this was the system in place in 1776, when there was a revolt against British rule to set up this country, it creates an incentive for the black population not to go along with the program. And then if you're part of a country and you're not going along with the program, then you're subject to being penalized and pulverized. 
which has been the case for Black people. I don't think you can begin to understand the case of George Floyd and Minnesota or Ralph Yarl, the teenager in Kansas City who shot in the head when he rings the wrong doorbell. On all of these cases, too numerous to mention, without understanding the culture that was created historically, whereby there was something perceived as wrong with being of African descent, and where by that creates an incentive for black people to rebel against the status quo, which then leads to them being pulverized and penalized uh, even more. And it's difficult to unravel these realities, however, because there is a competing narrative, as suggested, that this is the greatest country on earth and the creation of the United States was uh, this huge leap forward for humanity. And I, I was thinking about this the other day in terms of land acknowledgments. Now, Australia was also a British colony. In fact, um, once London is not able to send its poor to North America after it loses control of the United, what is now in the United States, that leads in 1788 to sending them to Australia. So in today's Australia, which is very much similar to the United States culturally and otherwise, it's quite common, uh, not just in university circles, but across the board to have land acknowledgement. Land acknowledgement is basically somebody will put on their email or say on a radio broadcast, uh, I acknowledge that I am on the unceded land of this indigenous group. Uh, land acknowledgements are quite common in, in Australia. They're not that common in the United States, other than certain universities. And then when you do it at certain universities, you're accused of being woke. <laughs> and then that leads to even more uh, insult and imprecations hurled at you. But I, I think that what that should cause us to reflect upon is why is it that in Australia this would be common? Of course, Australia did not revolt against British rule and set up independence. There was an elegated process leading to an independent Australia. The United States did, which has led to this notion that this is this great country and that can do no wrong. But then it becomes very difficult to explain the black experience, which, of course, leaves many black people in the United States very confused, leaves many of them angry. And it's not very healthy. Well, and I, I think you touched on it just now, and it was kind of what I wanted to um, talk about next, which is that um, in 1776, the with the Constitution and the, the founding of the of the America, uh, you say it's the first apartheid state based on race, and uh, you also say that uh, Africans had other plans for North American colonies than necessarily the colonists. So maybe you could talk a little bit about slave uprisings and how, um, I love the quote from Benjamin Franklin, every slave must be reckoned a domestic enemy. Mm -hmm. And why, what brought him to that? And and kind of the, because I think it builds into some of the, what you're talking about with the, um, the trauma of, you know, not only being black in America, but why you're perceived based on your skin color as inherently threatening. And I think it, it has roots in this, um, in what we're talking about here. Well, roots it does. Uh, as noted, uh, people are not happy with working for free. You have a lot of people who are unhappy about working for low wages, let alone working for free. <laughs> and so, it creates uh, a certain kind of fury and a certain kind of anger that then leads to arson attempts, poisoning attempts, murder attempts, and then you're perceived as an enemy of the state, which leads to your further uh, bludgeoning and attempts at further subjugation. But to put a timeline on this, so what happens is that, uh, and, and once again, I'm, I'm in the interest of time, I'm telescoping a, a lot of complex history. But to get to 1688, which is the so-called Glorious Revolution in London, which leads to an attempt to clip the wings of the monarch by the rising merchant class. And theretofore, 
the monarch, the king, had uh, de facto control of the wildly lucrative African slave trade. But with 1688, uh, the African slave trade is deregulated and merchants are able to enter it, which leads to a gigantic increase in the number of enslaved Africans who cross the Atlantic. It leads inevitably to slave uprisings, not least in the Caribbean, uh, because the ratios are, are different. That is to say, one European, nine Africans. Well, given those ratios, that's almost a recipe for slave revolts. Uh, North America is different, but even in North America, you have uh, increasing slave revolts. 1739, uh, Stono's Revolt in South Carolina, one of the bloodiest of the colonial era. I should have mentioned 1712 in Manhattan, New York City, 1741 in New York. Th this is in, in part a product of the numbers increasing. And uh, with these Africans arriving who have not been acclimated to this culture and this society and are not very pleased with being in this culture and society, and so they're willing to go on the war path. And this is the prelude to uh, 1776, in fact. Now, let me recommend a, a film, um, Bell, B-E-L-L-E. -L -L -E. it's, it's easily available. It's, it's probably, well, it's probably a pirate copy floating around somewhere. I'm sure the library, not in the Cleveland Public Library, I'm, I'm certain of that. Um, but it tells the story in part of Somerset's case, 1772 in London, whereby it is thought that England is moving to abolish the slave trade, if not slavery. And this is a reaction uh, to all of the upset in the Caribbean. Uh, before Somerset's case, there's Tacky's Revolt uh, in Jamaica, uh, which, which before the Haitian Revolution, when the Africans finally revolt and seize power, before the Haitian Revolution, 1791 to 1804, you have Tacky's Revolt, which is sort of a, a precursor to the Haitian Revolution. And so uh, this is creating a volcano of unrest. And at the same time that you have this volcano of unrest amongst the enslaved population, you still have the indigenous population on the warpath. Many of them are not happy uh, about um, their lands being overrun. In fact, before Somerset's case, 1772, about a decade or so earlier, you have the so-called Royal Pro Proclamation whereby London cast doubt upon continuing to wage war against the Native Americans moving from the Atlantic seaboard westward and taking their land, which is upsetting to many who are land hungry, and not least the uh, leading land speculator, speaking of George Washington. That is a further log on the fire uh, with regard to a settler, a discontent with London, uh, fanning the flames for what erupts in 1776. Now, uh, I should make the point here with regard to the construction of history, because much of what I'm saying now, it's, it's, it's just a matter of fact, in Somerset's case, Royal Proclamation, Stono's Revolt, New York City, Slave Revolt, 1712, 1741. <laughs> But history is not just recounting facts and dates. It's creating a story. It's creating a narrative. It's creating an explanation. And so, obviously, I'm creating a certain kind of narrative using these historical markers, these historical facts. You'll have another his historian who will ignore Somerset's case, who will ignore the Royal Proclamation, ignore the slave revolts, and construct another kind of narrative. Uh, based upon settlers in Lexington revolting uh, in 1775 and complaints against London, another kind of narrative. And so uh, right now in the United States, 
you have a battle over narratives in part. Uh, that is to say, some have a narrative that's similar to mine. Some have a narrative totally dissimilar to mine. And then these narratives clash. And perhaps sooner rather than later, uh, we'll come to a consensus. Well, I, I hope we do get a chance and we're not all written into uh, the dustbin of history with the various um, law, uh, I guess there are laws coming out. We have one coming down through the house right now that would make it impossible for us to even talk about this right. uh, while I'm at work. So, uh, <laughs> there's, so yes, you could look at different facts, but there's also uh, forces as you so greatly um, illuminate uh, that, you know, dominate some of these narratives and take these facts and, and make them um, a reality that can be seen either as a spark of liberty or a spark of the end of days, as it were. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that's, uh, uh, I, I tend to lean more towards your uh, reading of history uh, because it's so compelling. So I would uh, like to give you an opportunity to let, kind of, uh, if you have anything you want to leave us with, um, maybe a moment of hope. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm always hopeful. Um, you know, as a descendant of enslaved Africans, uh, that, that comes with the territory. But I don't want to get false hope at the same time, because as suggested by these laws that are right around the corner, that would seek to circumscribe the teaching of what I would consider it an adequate and accurate story of history, uh, that kind of maneuver is oftentimes the precursor for something much more devilish, I'm afraid to say. So one can be on hope and still be on guard. One can be hopeful and still be on guard, I should say. And I think that that's the best descriptor for myself and the kind of advice I would pass on. Uh, be hopeful, but as they used to say in the United States, keep your potter dry. Um, I should also say that uh, for those who might be interested, uh, you know, I've written on the 16th century, the 17th century, the 18th century, 19th century, 20th century. And in a few days, I'll have a book coming out on Washington, D.C., the city of Washington, D.C., uh, which is a predominantly black city to this day. And their struggles over the 20th century. So I would recommend that uh, to your audience. Yes, we'll definitely uh, be on the lookout for that. And that's a, that's a fantastic topic, too. Uh, how much it factored into the Civil War as well and the whole... Um, yeah, like that whole, should D.C. be slave-owning or not slave-owning? Yes, yes, yes. Well, actually, I'm working on a book now on slavery in Washington, D.C., uh, although I've only finished maybe about 15% of the research, so it's difficult for me to pronounce on it. But um, uh, I hope to make progress on that project in the next few weeks, in fact. Thanks for listening to Unpacking 1619. For more information on Heights Library 1619 Project Discussion Group, or to check out more interviews with scholars, please visit heightslibrary.org. See you next episode, wherever you listen to podcasts.